Well, welcome everyone to Power Principles. I'm your host, Dr. Van Gaten. I'm the academic dean at the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary at the Church 320 here in Jacksonville, Florida, under the leadership of Bishop Stan Williams. And it's my honor to come to you today uh, to share the Word of God. And I want to make a couple of announcements before we begin today. First of all, I wanted to remind you of the book that I wrote for my dissertation at Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, The Good News for Racism from Liberation to Reconciliation. As you can see, it's a small read, compre not comprehensive, but concise. And I think it'll be a blessing to you because it's gospel-centered, spirit-anointed. So the good news for racism, you can get this at Amazon. It's in paperback or on Kindle. So please avail yourself of that. Also, I want you to know that all the programs that I do here on Impact Network also are available on YouTube. I post them on YouTube, my YouTube channel, so that if you miss it Saturday mornings at 8 o'clock on Impact Network, you can get it later on YouTube as well. So it's under, on YouTube, just go to Dr. Van Gaten, Power Principles. And there you will find, also, I'm on Facebook. So I, every day I kind of put comments out there, food for thought, because we got many things that we need to talk about. Okay, so I shared with you in the last couple sessions that I tried to show the balance between piety and protest, that the Christian walk, I believe, from an Afrocentric hermeneutic, teaches us piety, you ought to live right before God, but protest, the, the Bible says, cry loud and spare not. So we, are, we have a right to speak truth to power. That is the prophetic nature of the black church, speak truth to power. And so it's not either or, it's both and. It's, it, and that's the way we've got to look at it. It's not Neoplatonic conflict with each other. It's Aristotelian both and. So let's live in both. And some of us are more given to piety than protest, but <clears throat> it's important that the, the black church be involved in piety and protest. Now, under protest, let's begin there today, I noticed that uh, on Monday in the state of South Carolina, it was the celebration of the Confederacy. It was a holiday. <laughs> and they took the flag down, the Confederate flag, but the holiday is still there in South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi. And uh, that's, it's really sad to our hearts that that's still going on because the very root, and that's all I'm going to deal with today, the root of the Confederacy was all about <clears throat> that they believed that God had ordained them, that Noah was considered the patron of the plantation life. God had ordained those that were white to be rulers or paternal over black slaves. That was God's will. And when they lost the Civil War, they may have lost the war, but they won the rhetoric around the Civil War because as the daughters of the Confederacy went around and put uh, monuments everywhere from their, their own son, sons and husbands, then it just spread out over time, especially during the Civil Rights Movement. They put up statutes all over, and Richmond, Virginia became like the headquarters of all the monuments put up by the Daughters of the Confederacy. Why that? Because they believe, now get this, this is a religious part of the, of the story. They believe, that this is their analogy. The Apostle Paul, he preached the truth even though they persecuted him uh, and eventually killed him. Secondly, Jesus preached the truth and they killed him, but he rose from the dead. And just like Jesus rose from the dead, maybe in the South we lost the war, but we shall be raised from the dead 
uh, the South shall live again. That's where that phrase comes from. The South shall live again. And that's why they have the annual um, parade or reenactment of the Civil War, just like in the movie Sweet Home Alabama. And so we need to recognize, you know, that in Germany, where the Holocaust for the Jews took place by Hitler, do you know that a swastika is illegal in the country of Germany? So the swastika, talking about white Aryan leadership and supremacy, that's been shot down. And in Germany, a child cannot graduate from school without getting a thorough, complete, accurate understanding of the brutalness and the cruelty of the Holocaust. They venture into society with full understanding of their own history. And I think we can learn from Germany that we don't need Confederate monuments and signs, etc. We don't need Confederate holidays. This nation needs to repent for what it did to the Africans that were enslaved in this country. So, uh, and then the second thought I want to share with you, in America right now we have this resurgence um, where they're very concerned that this Project 1619, uh, we, it's, they try to say that, well, it's a, it's a doctrine of hate. It's teaching, us, it's teaching our children to hate our country. And that is such a biased statement because the fact of the matter is, as W.E. Du Bois said, we have a dual, blacks have a dual consciousness in America. We love America, but we hate what America did to us and is doing to us, but we love living in America. There is that paradoxical nature once again. And if you are uh, of, of uh, European descent, you may not understand that. That's why it has to be listening to us and empathy for us because we have a unique posture in this nation. We did not come over on the Mayflower. We came over a year earlier on a ship called the White Lion. So it is not a history of hate that we're trying to teach children. It's a history of the truth. Throw out that sanitized version of, of American history that's being perpetrated by so many who are blind and don't want to acknowledge the truth that slavery, no matter how you look at it, it was evil. It was just evil evil. So we're trying to say if we teach our children well, then we will not make that mistake in human history of America again. So again, we love this nation, but we hate the institution of slavery. All right, now let's leave off on the protest and go back to our piety today. And I ended up last week by saying to you that uh, uh, the, the topic of my uh, sermon was, What Kind of Pharisee Are You? From the book of St. Matthew, chapter 23. What kind of Pharisee? So this is part two of that message. Uh, it's very important that we recognize that in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, you will find the same comments on the Pharisees in Mark and in Luke, but because Matthew was written to the Jews primarily about their genealogy, uh, G Jesus gives a whole chapter of, of, to this issue. It's that important to him. And why? Because the Pharisees were the main opposition to Jesus when he spent a couple of years around the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel and then in Jerusalem uh, in the latter days of his life. And so here was the main fight. Now, it's real important that we understand also that we're looking at chapter 23, which we did last week, and today we want to look at what's called the Talmud, all right? Now, the Talmud is very important because you know, when we look at the history of the Jews, they were called the people of the book or the people of the law. And the key in Israel's history was Mount Sinai. And Ezra, uh, at, his, at the national dedication to keeping the law in Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 8. So the law was very important to them. From the, from the day they studied the law to become 
it became the greatest profession in Israel, according to Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Also, it was about 175 B.C. that Antiochus Epiphany tried to make the Greek uh, religion and culture all through Israel, and at that moment, the Pharisees uh, came forward. They're called the separated ones. And, uh, but, but also, we recognize that Jesus expressed the law in four different ways. He talked about the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words of God, the Decalogue, the first five books of the Bible, which are called the Pentateuch, and uh, then, it, then we recognize, number three, there was the whole of Scripture, the Tanakh. And then number four, there was such a thing as the oral or scribal law. The oral or scribal law. Now, the oral and scribal law was the, called the Mishnah, the Mishnah for the Jews. And, and then there was the Talmud, which was a commentary on the Mishnah. All right? So why do I bring up the Talmud? Because when Jesus talked about what uh, the Pharisees were doing, and I, in chapter 23 of Matthew, there are seven times he used the phrase, whoa, whoa, which is a to call down malediction upon those who would live like Pharisees. But also, the, you have the chapter 23 of Matthew, but then you have the Talmud, because the Talmud, which was also a commentary uh, on the Mishnah, gives us that there were seven kinds of Pharisees. So that was already understood. The Jews had their own perception of the Pharisees, and Jesus was just reiterating what they already were talking about and how they viewed the Pharisees. They had become... They had come to think that they were all that in a bag of chips with the dip, and Jesus blew them away. So if we recognize that chapter uh, 23 of Matthew, it covers uh, making religion a burden in verse 1 through 4 of Matthew 23, then the religion of ostentatiousness. Why? Because they like to be heard. They like the best seed in the house. I know none of us are guilty of that. They like to hear their name called. They went through all of that. Uh, then verse 13, they shut the door to everyone else, uh, the, the keys to the kingdom. They didn't want to enter, and they didn't want anybody else. So we just, they just wanted the attention on them. Also, Jesus called them missionaries of evil. You know, not that the Jews, uh, uh, the Pharisees were missional, missional, but the people of God, because they were, they were God-fearing Jews and they were proselytes, because the average Jew didn't mind telling other people and didn't mind other nationalities coming into the faith, you know. But when the Jews did it, they made people twice dead because they just didn't live what they taught. Then the science of evasion. Why? Because they are trying to give a religious appearance, but they avoided the real issues of God. Uh, they didn't even want to take an oath in the name of Yahweh because that oath would be more binding upon them. So they have tried to skirt the issues, skirt the issues that were really primary to them. And so we can rate down through. We see the, the, the lost sense of proportion. You, you're, swallowing a, you're swallowing a camel and choking on a gnat. Why? Because that's the way the Pharisees, Jesus, and you're, you're, you're disguised, you're decay. You know, you're, you're looking good on the outside, but you're full of dead man bones. You just, you just don't have it. And then uh, you recognize also that the rejection of love was appealing. Now, it says in verse 37 of Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, there's the explanation point, O, oh, O, oh, exclamatory thought, O, oh, O, oh, you kill the prophets and stone and those sent to you. How often I would have longed to gather you. Now, there's a statement that cuts right across uh, uh, what we would call what? Calvinism. Uh, and it's more Arminian because our free will. God said, I would have gathered you, but you would not. And so the free will 
He still honors the free will. And yet God, he holds back. That's a self-imposed restraint. Not because we can push God anywhere. That's impossible. But God can decide that I'm going to give you a little latitude. And you can, either be, you can either be blessed because you respond correctly, or you can hang yourself because you disobey me. But I'm going to let that onus be upon you. So Matthew 23 the rejection of love's appeal. God longs. And here we see the heart of God. Here we see the heart of Jesus. No matter how the Pharisees were acting, the Lord loves his creation. And I think we see that clearly today is that you wonder, I don't know why God loves me. Well, he loves you because he created you. He loves this world because he created this world. So God is a lover. God is love. That's a noun, not an adjective. Loving God, it makes loving an adjective. But he is a God is love. That makes it a noun. That's who he is. That's what he's all about. He doesn't choose to be. He is. He is love. All right? So now we move from Jesus taking a whole chapter to deal with these Pharisees. Now we switch to the Talmud, and they had seven kinds of Pharisees listed. This was understood by the Jewish people. And what was the first kind of Pharisee? And as I go down through, let's be honest before God. Let's be honest with the, the scripture that we have to know what kind of Pharisee is in us. We all got a little bit of Pharisee and some more than others, but nevertheless, uh, we're being sanctified. It, that, that's the way it is. But you can't be sanctified unless you allow the Spirit of God to convict you, convict you, not condemn you, but convict you. And when the Spirit convicts you, then you need to confess so that he can set you free and forgive us of all sins. So the first kind of Pharisee was called a shoulder Pharisee, a shoulder Pharisee, like the physical shoulders. Uh, and these, these Pharisees are meticulous in the observance of the law. In other words, they wear their good deeds on their shoulder. They want you to see every good deed that they are performing. Look here, I'm giving an offering. Look here, I'm giving uh, $10, $100, $1,000, whatever. But they want, and oh, I'm feeding the poor. Look at, look at, look at, look at. I'm visiting people at the hospital. Uh, I'm going to prayer. They want, they, they carry the Pharisees literally. Um, they're in, in observance of the law. They wore their good deeds on their shoulders. Now, I know there, that we all struggle with this, that we want, we want people to notice our good news. Even when we pray, uh, the Bible says, go in your closet, anoint your head, and wipe your head, face so people don't know that you're praying and fasting. Why does Jesus say that? Because it's part of our need for sanctification to want to shoulder everybody to see, to wear our good deeds upon our shoulders for everyone to see. All right, so the second kind of Pharisee, this was called, this person was called a, a bleeding or bruised Pharisee. In other words, self-afflicting, self-flagellation. Uh, this Pharisee would not look on a woman in public. Uh, it was a, is a very pharisaical attitude of self-righteousness that a man would not look on a woman, if he was a Pharisee, in public. I don't care if it was his wife or his daughter, not in public. And, and so we, they would run into obstacles just to avoid seeing the woman. And so that is a real self-righteous kind of attitude. Even Job said, I made a covenant in, with my eyes, I, with the Lord, with my eyes, that I will not look upon another handmaiden. So we can't walk around with blinders on. We can't, but we can ask the Lord to cleanse us from what is called adulterous eyes that our eyes can be full of adultery and God wants to cleanse us from that, but we can't walk around bumping into walls and street corners calling ourselves the bleeding Pharisees. All this blood is because I'm staying pure by not looking at a woman instead of letting God purify our hearts. And you'll notice whether it's in sanctified churches or whatever, but all the onus is always put on the woman, long dresses, no makeup, etc. But nothing about what the guy should do about our eyes in the relationship 
to women. All right, next we have what was called a wait a little Pharisee. What is a wait a little Pharisee? Uh, <clears throat> this Pharisee uh, would produce valid excuses for putting off doing good deeds. Uh, he spoke, but he did not do. That's your wait a little. And we have many people today in the kingdom of God that they, they, they'll tell you, yep, I want to do good deeds, but I got to wait. I got to do something else. There's always an excuse why the good deed is being put off. And we can be like the Pharisees as well. Await a little Pharisees. And so I challenge you, if you're that kind of Pharisee is in your heart, then we need to ask the Lord to set us free, that we need to quit make excuses for doing the good deed and go ahead and do them. Do them and not make excuses for them. The wait a little Pharisee. Number four, we have what is called the humpback Pharisee or the tumbling Pharisee. Uh, he is the one that walked ostentatiously with humility, ostentatious humility. Uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't even lift his feet off the ground. He would trip over everything to keep his foot, because they were trying to give the sense um, uh, of, of being humble. You know, just uh, like the saying says, you know, I'm humble and proud of it. Well, you know, we, we can have, we need to ask God to give us an accurate assessment of ourself and God. And if you have an accurate assessment of yourself and God, then that is the base of humility. You're not thinking more of yourself than you should, nor less of yourself than you should, but a accurate assessment from the word of God, okay? And we can walk around like we're humble, uh, as these Pharisees did, dragging their feet on the ground, tripping over everything. Why? Because they didn't want to take, lift their feet from the ground. I, I heard uh, an old saint say one time, if, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can, you don't have to fall into sin if you stay on your knees. And we need to stay on our knees before Almighty God in prayer, but then get up and walk with Him. Like Enoch walked with God. Walk with God. But we don't need to be uh, these, uh, this ostentatious humility of a humpback Pharisee. Number five is called a compounding Pharisee, a compounding Pharisee. Uh, what is a compounding? Is that a mathematical Pharisee? Uh, no, it's a reference to this kind of Pharisee is known for, he is known for keeping records of his good deeds for God. In other words, I did something good. I'm going to write down everything that I've done good for God, and they have their own balance sheet. Lord, I did this, so now you should do that. I did this, Lord. Look what I did. Now I'm expecting you, Lord. I'm expecting you as if uh, only in the mercy of God do we get anything from heaven. Everything we have, we receive by the grace and mercy of Almighty God. But I would suggest that we not try to keep a balance sheet on Almighty God because he could pull out another balance sheet that shows all the things that we messed up on, but he doesn't do that. He, he puts our sins far away as the east is from the west. He remembers our sins no more, or he doesn't hold it to our account. He doesn't keep the balance sheet to stick in our face. So with every good deed put to God, they, they feel like, well, God is in debt to me, and, uh, and it's a profit and loss kind of situation. Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest you do that. I, would, I, would, I think we should do good deeds and then trust in the mercy of Almighty God. And then number six, we call it the timid or fearing Pharisee in the Talmud. The fearing or timid Pharisee, that's number six, lived in the dread of divine punishment. Now, they walked around always cleansing plates and cups and everything, washing hands and everything like that because they were afraid that God was going to punish, there would be divine punishment, that God's a big bully up there and he's about to drop the hammer on you. We have Christians that feel that way today, that they feel like, God, if I did this, I did this, so God's going to probably hit me and hurt me. Listen, that's a timid or fearing Pharisee, and God wants us to 
get free from that because if you're in Christ, when Christ looks at you, he sees the blood of his son and the spirit of the living God. And besides, God already knows everything about us before we ever found out about ourselves. So, a timid or fearing Pharisee. Now, the last time, the last one we want to look at today is the one we call a God-fearing Pharisee. This is the kind we want to be. There are six that we don't want. Six is the numerical number of man, the number of man. But the seventh speaks of perfection, divine perfection. And the seventh kind of Pharisee <clears throat> is what we should like. The seventh kind of Pharisee, he really loved God and f found delight in obedience to the law of God, no matter how difficult, because I love God. I will present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Almighty God. And guess what? Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, you know? And so there were some Pharisees who did love Jesus, who did follow the Lord, who did renounce all the Pharisaical attitudes and attributes and decided that they wanted to fall in love with Jesus. And Paul was such a believer. He, he was a Pharisee, but he loved God. And he made sure that he took a delight in, oh, that I might know him. Listen, this is the heart of Paul, and this should be our heart. Listen, in closing today, I want to share a, an insight that God gave to me. When you think of the Lord on the cross, you cannot forget that there were two thieves, one on either side of Jesus. Now, one thief represents what? He represents legalism, and we know what legalism is, and then the other thief on the cross represents antinomianism. So we've got some Christians who claim Christianity, all right, but they're very legalistic. Oh my goodness, don't touch that, don't do this, don't look at that. You know, they think legalism has really become their way. And then we got antinomianism where some people say, well, I'm, I'm saved and by the grace of God, I can do this, that, and the other, and God will understand. Well, listen, either way, Jesus is the center and if you look to the thieves, that's what they're called, thieves on the cross, because they will rob you of your right relationship with Jesus. If you look at Jesus, remember, it was his legs that they never broke. If you follow the thief on the left, the, their legs were broken. The thief on the right, his legs were broken. If you follow either one of them, your legs will be broken. You know, But if you follow the Lord, they did not break his legs and you will have an upright life because you're not allowing the enemy to steal away the purity of love and being that Pharisee who, who is a God-fearing, God-loving Pharisee. That's the right one we want to be. And there were some in the New Testament who were. And I trust that God will deliver all of us from all those Pharisaical attitudes that we are convicted of, not condemned, and make us what we ought to be. So, Father, I pray right now that you will stretch forth your hand and heal us and deliver us from the pharisaical attitude and make us true lovers of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen, amen. God bless you.